I've always been fascinated by the juxtaposition of our two scripture readings for today. On the one hand, we have our text from the Epistle to the Hebrews, which speaks confidently of Jesus' role as our advocate or intercessor, saying that he is uniquely qualified to understand or sympathize with our human weaknesses because he has been tested or tempted in every way as we are, but without sin. Tempted in every way as we are. And then on the other hand, I read the gospel accounts of Jesus' temptation or trial in the wilderness. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe Jesus retreating to the wilderness following his baptism to undergo a sort of a vision quest. What does it mean for him to be God's son or to usher in God's kingdom or to follow God's call? Mark simply offers a one-sentence account. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. But Matthew and Luke draw from a tradition that has a much more elaborate description of Jesus' time of trial. The adversary, Satan, is much more present and personalized in these accounts, actually engaging Jesus in conversation and offering him three distinct and fantastical temptations to turn stones into bread in order that he may eat, to throw himself bodily from the pinnacle of the temple in order that he may be saved by miraculous divine intervention, and to bow down and worship the tempter in order that he may be granted authority over all the kingdoms of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but here's my challenge. When I hear the text, Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. And then I hear an account of a sort of a supernatural contest in the wilderness. Well, I simply haven't been tempted like that. I've never been tempted in the least to turn stones into bread. Even if I'm really hungry, I wouldn't even begin to know how. I've never been bodily transported to the top of the temple and invited to swan dive into the arms of the angels to prove God's protection of me. I have never had an offer of world dominion extended to me in exchange for my devotion to an evil tempter. So at first glance, I read Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus, and it seems to have little to do with me or with my life or even with my faith. I don't happen to believe in the devil as a physical presence or a distinct personalized entity like some bad version of God. So what to do with this rather strange temptation text from Matthew? Well, for me, it helps to strip away some of the supernatural imagery. Many paintings of the temptation show Jesus engaging a goat-horned, bat-winged tempter. But the Russian painter, Ivan Kramskoy, depicted the temptation of Jesus in a magnificently melancholy painting that shows Jesus simply seated on a rock in the wilderness. There's no physical devil present. In fact, no one is present. The focus is simply on a worn and weary Jesus who looks like he's had about 40 rough days. The temptation, the struggle that Jesus faces in this depiction is evidently entirely internal. His best self against his worst self, perhaps. Or what God is calling him to be and to do versus what the world or his own impulses invite him to be and to do. And that, at least, is a beginning place for me to relate to the story of Jesus' wilderness struggle. Because I well know the inward struggle between right and wrong, or between what I know I should do and what I want to do. Somebody cuts me off in traffic. I may know in theory that they're a child of God. <laughs> but my first impulse isn't to treat them like one. 
So a tug of war between what my faith calls me to on the one hand versus what my impulses call me to on the other, I get that pretty well. Why be obedient to what my faith asks of me when it feels so necessary, so satisfying to act otherwise? So perhaps that in fact is the same struggle that Jesus faces in his wilderness trial. The temptation to substitute what is easy or accessible for what is right. But the specific temptations Stones into bread, leaping from the temple, worshiping the tempter in exchange for the world's rewards. I still need a little help with those. Well, Matthew gives us some clues by using Jesus' responses to the temptations in the wilderness to ground them in Israel's experiences of temptation during their wandering in the desert wilderness with Moses. In the first temptation, Jesus is invited to turn aside from his path due to hunger and to turn stones into bread. And he replies, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that response is a quote of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, in which Moses reminds the people of Israel that when they grumbled in the wilderness and wanted to turn aside from God's path and God's promise and return to Egypt, God fed them manna day by day by day in order that they might understand that the source of their bread is God. Until they understand and internalize that, God will provide God will provide, God will provide. Their faith will last only as long as their last meal. The source of their life is not bread or food, but the God who provides their bread or their food. Now where Israel grumbles and doubts in their hunger in the wilderness, Jesus places his trust in God and not in bread alone. Don't place your trust in bread itself, but in the provider of the bread. In the second temptation, when Jesus is invited to test God's providence and care by leaping from the temple, he again quotes scripture. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the full quote is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as when you tested him at Massah. And this refers to a time or an episode in the wilderness described in Exodus chapter 17 where the people complained, is God among us or not? And they demanded proof. Jesus, on the other hand, refuses to make God prove God's care. And the final temptation, to worship anything other than God, is also grounded in Israel's wilderness wanderings. When Moses has left the people and gone up on the mountain to pray, the people are tempted to put their trust in another god, a golden calf, symbol of the common nature fertility religions of the ancient Near East. And the temptation in brief is to place their trust in powers other than the one God, to trust their fortunes and their care to powers other than the one God. And again, the Hebrew people fail the test by fashioning an alternative God, while again Jesus passes the test by declining to obey any voice but God's voice alone. So we see that the temptations that Jesus faces are related to human temptations by connecting them with the temptations of Israel in the wilderness. But is the text relevant to me today? Do I in any way face those same temptations? Well, in a word, yes. Take the first temptation 
put trust in bread rather, in the God, rather than in the God who provides the bread. This is the pull down your barns and build bigger barns temptation. This is essentially to trust in one's own resources rather than to trust in God. It's the same as putting my trust in my ability to earn money rather than understanding that all that I have or all that I can do or all that I can ever own or earn proceeds not from my ability to grasp or to produce or to provide, but from God's faithfulness in providing. The second temptation, to demand proof of God's love or care. The helpful analogy for me here is that of a jealous lover, one who continually demands, if you really loved me, you would demonstrate it by buying me gifts. If you really loved me, you'd take me on a trip to Paris. If you really loved me, then you'd prove it in ever more dramatic fashion, and my belief in your love is only as strong as your most recent demonstration of it. In inviting Jesus to prove how much he trusts God by leaping from the temple, the tempter is really inviting, prove how much you don't trust God by demanding that God prove God's care to you in a dramatic fashion. The third temptation, bow down and worship me, and I will give you power over the kingdoms of the world, is another invitation. Don't trust God, trust worldly wealth. Don't trust God, trust power. Don't trust God, trust the tools of empire. So let me boil the temptations down to their lowest common denominator, because they're really just three variations on a theme. Don't put your trust in God, put your trust in blank. Don't put your trust in God, put your trust in bread, or physical comfort, or tangible resources. Trust the resources themselves rather than the God who provides them. Don't put your trust in God, put your trust in drama and spectacle. God only loves you as much as God's most recent demonstration of God's love. Or finally, don't put your trust in God. Trust power to achieve your ends and to provide your ultimate security. Trust armies, trust guns, trust wealth. These are the sources of your success and your security, not God. In that sense, I come to understand that these temptations are very similar to the ones that we may face daily. And so given that constant struggle, how do I learn to trust? To remind myself again and again and again, God will provide, God will provide, God will provide. Well, one place that we will learn that repeated message is at this table. Here we receive every gift that is sufficient. Here we are strengthened by the self-giving love of God. Here we are fed, not by our industry, not by our deserving, not by anything more than God's abundant generosity. We are reminded at this table that God provides our every need. So come and take and eat and take heart. Our host at the table is the one who himself was tempted in every way as we are, but without sin. Amen.